So there are many, many, many potentially relevant data points about a particular patient or a particular population that play into knowing that if I see a particular type of lesion in the colon, if I throw in all those other data points, I can be not just preventative, I can be predictive about how that patient may do in five, 10 years time and how often they need to have more procedures. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja. I'm a hematologist, medical oncologist in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I also known as the Onc Doc on social media. And I'm super excited to have Dr. Michael Fern, who has actually gotten his medical doctorate. I read, I didn't tell you this, the real way it should be done, right? A doctorate, technically, it was like PhDs at first. You teach and you got a thesis and a real medical degree at Cambridge, like the traditional classic way. And then you like trained or or did some time at Duke, and now you're in Vancouver, and then you did all kinds of very pun-related like uh, companies that have to do with uh, with a pun with AI. You're basically a guru when it comes to endoscopic stuff and GI stuff and diagnosing stuff on a genomic and molecular level, as well as now on a techie level. And I don't know how you do it. That's why I'm very humbled to be here. Thank you for for kind of being here to teach us about all the GI knowledge that you have from all over the world. It sounds like. Wow, have you been speaking to my mother? Because that sounds like she wrote that uh, that intro. Um, <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned the, uh, the 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 uh, the the real doctorate thing. There are two higher degrees in Cambridge of uh, real doctorate. It's uh, medicine is number three, law comes second, and the first one is Doctor of Divinity. So I'm not sure that I'm ever going to get one of those. Oh, there you wow. Go. I love that I know that fact now. I just never knew. No. Uh, yeah. My yeah. uncle actually went to Cambridge and did his medical degree there years ago. He's from India, um, but he studied there. So that's a, it's a neat little that's a neat little tidbit fact. There's so much I want to unpack. I mean, you're working, you know, on a lot of things now. You have a very cool company called Satisfy Health, but the I is AI. But before we get to that, because I'm actually really curious on, uh, you know, there's such a needed space on diagnosing cancer sooner, right? Like that is the biggest challenge. If I always give the example, if you have a cancer on your hand or in your face, obviously you want to wait before it infiltrates everything and is huge. And in your lymph nodes, you cut it out. And the same thing applies to the organs in the body. You know, the skin's an organ and so is your colon and everything else. And so I'm very eager to hear how you're getting into all of that and seeing it sooner because- we actually talked to Dr. Jason Fung, who wrote uh, the obesity code and the cancer code and stuff. And he's talking about how, you know, there's so many, there's some populations where if they have low glycemic indices and stuff, they have a lot less uh, incidence of colorectal cancer. But in the States with processed food, whatever the reason may be, insulin overload, which is a growth factor, lack of fiber, whatever it is, there is a lot of colorectal cancer. And we're like pushing the guidelines lower. And it's family history is very important if you have it, but if you don't, by, by no means uh, means that you're spared. And one of the biggest frustrations is, whereas I can get a full body CT scan and see if they have a lung mass or a liver mass or whatever, that doesn't work that way in the tubing or the or the piping of the entire yep. intestine, right? I, I had a patient yeah. today actually. They're like, so does that mean I don't have anything? I was like, no, I, I, I'm afraid you do, but but we can't look in the colon in the CT scan. So. You have a wealth of knowledge. Where do we start with talking about, one, I hope we address the concept of catching something early. Two, we talk about visualizing. That's why you got to get in there and really look to see with a camera. What are you doing and what are you seeing now on how we can possibly better evaluate for colon cancer that's not spread yet, that's in that little folds and all that stuff of the of the intestine? How are we doing it? What are you doing to be able to say, Sanjay, I think I can catch it sooner this way? So my field, I'm still occasionally practicing as well as uh, running this company. My field of gastroenterology is, a, I think, a great example for the general listenership around the applications or the, the potential, the need for artificial intelligence solutions um, to help us. Because GI cancers throughout the entire intestine, from the mouth all the way to the other end, so colon cancer, stomach cancer, esophageal cancer, we miss those things, right? We 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 are getting better at, at uh, treatment. We're getting better at picking things up earlier, but getting better doesn't mean that we are great. So you, you asked about colonoscopy and colon cancer uh, screening. The guidelines are pushing the envelope. I love it that we are now looking at uh, population-based guidelines. We are trying to uh, lower the age for starting uh, screening appropriately. 
we're using other tests that people can can do to give them a, a an idea that they're a higher risk but we're still relying on a human driven modality so i and colleagues of mine we put a camera into the collar and we look and the utility of that test depends on my finding polyps okay polyps are little precancerous or potentially precancerous lesions that can lead to colon cancer and if we miss them cancers get uh, uh developed and uh you know it's not a great outcome so human nature is such that we do miss things uh i don't care what any of my colleagues say i stand on the podium now as an ai advocate and i still get challenged by people in the audience saying my polyp detection rate is amazing i don't need artificial intelligence and i say okay well that is great i'm glad that you don't think you can get better because everybody can get better um but there are many many people out there who you know perform averagely and i'm not sure that i want to be having my fate um for screening based on an average evaluation so we absolutely need help to find small polyps or even larger polyps behind all these folds that you talk about all the corners in the corner and all the crevices again that you mentioned things get hidden there we get distracted we get tired as humans so long story short yes we need help that's incredible you say that because now you know and i'm almost embarrassed to say this i'm very vocal about catching iron deficiency early and working it up if somebody doesn't have a reason to be iron deficient right if you didn't have a gastric bypass or or you didn't you know you're not premenopausal and you're having cycles but but i talk a lot about that on my social media uh, especially males postmenopausal but i had this habit of saying hey your colonoscopy is clean at least we know you don't have colon cancer or pre cancer but i never really thought about the fact that you're depending on one human their eyeballs their brain processing all of that for me to make such a bold statement i'm trusting as if it's a computer that everything was scoped all the way around circumferentially in, in 360 degrees all the way around all the way th that is a crazy actually almost like goosebump concept that you know traditionally we're just learned if you call us be clean you don't have anything but the truth of the matter is you're looking much smaller than that like and we know that colon cancers can start like not necessarily be big whopping tumor for the most part we learn traditionally that it's you have a lead time and you have this tubulo villus adenoma and it's bigger and and you caught it because six percent can turn into cancer in five years or what you know whatever the statistics are but the truth of the matter is we've learned more and been humbled that it's not necessarily always longer bigger you have all this lead time like you do in you know cervical cancer and the pap smear there you have a lead time very rarely do you have a cervical cancer that's just popped out of nowhere that you didn't have cin1 and two and you saw all these changes over time Colon cancer, for the most part, is like that, but we know that things can escape it, especially, especially the scary one is when you're talking about esophageal and gastric and all of those. Those aren't as, they're not as, as kind, and I don't mean that insensitively, as what the lesions are in the colon before they turn into cancer later. So what you're saying is there, we need to make sure that there is, and with all the technology that we have, how, is there and are there ways to visualize things that are statistically to some degree abnormal and i'm sure you catch a lot of stuff that would be you know steps away from cancer as well that might have not been picked up if you know if you were doing it endoscopically uh, endoscopically as a human yeah I, I think there's maybe one uh key metric that i can share with you in the audience here uh there's something in colonoscopy called the adr or the adenoma detection rate and that's basically picking up the types of polyp that can become cancerous those are called adenomas the ADR should be 40, 50, 60% if you're performing at a good level in that population. Um, and we know from studies that for every 1% increase in ADR um, that the doctor has, you will decrease the mortality from colon cancer by 3%. So anything to increase your polyp or your adenoma detection rate is only to be increased. That's why I challenge people who say to me or to, you know, AI advocates in general, I don't need technology to help me. I'm already very good. And I go, well, again, like I said before, you can always get better because that 1% increase is decreasing the mortality overall by 3%. It's a very simple and key metric and nobody can argue against it. It's well evaluated and well published. So um, yes, we can definitely get better. We need to achieve the higher standard and it, it's a multitude of things. It's it's human and machine in perfect harmony, right? Um, taking the assistance, recognizing that 
the, Sanjay, there are even studies that show, and I don't want to alarm the audience, but that later in the day, maybe in the afternoon, late afternoon, that colonoscopy performance goes down. Humans are tired. You've had a long day. Um, not willfully, but things get missed. And there are some stats that show that. And that's additionally where technology can help us, right? We pardon this interruption real quick. If you're enjoying this podcast or find it valuable for what we discuss and the education and how people see and think about cancer in general, we would very much appreciate a like, subscribe, and especially a share so we can bring that information as maximally and broadly as possible. Thank you so much for listening. That's a very powerful statement you made. You said in the adenoma detection rate. So I want anyone to be clear. You didn't say in 1% increase for cancerous lesions or carcinomas. You said just the benign lesion, meaning non-malignant. Yep. If you can detect 1% more, you will actually spare 3% of deaths from colorectal cancer because it goes to that whole lead time concept of find something, take it out because it's already on kind of first base and it just needs to go four or five bases to turn into malignancy or cancer, which is, you know, again, giving me goosebumps. So, now I just got to ask, like, how 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 are we doing that? Like, is it, you know, we hear about these kind of like, I get asked all the time on social media, you know, if I don't want a colonoscopy, how good is the sensitivity on these, you know, molecular tests? You're seeing the shedding of tumor uh, DNA, or at least what we know is often seen in tumors that have cancers. It's not necessarily the tumor DNA, but just kind of a match. And now they're talking about images that can look, um, you know, similar to a colon better than that kind of CT scan that I talked about. What are you doing and how are you doing it? And before I say, ask that, one of the biggest like knocks I have, and I, it's not that I don't support it, but with tests like gallery, where you're able to kind of test a, a bunch of cancers and catch it. I always say, what's going to happen though, when you catch a, a cancer and you do a pan CT, like head to toe and you don't see anything. This sounds like it's one of those things that at least gives me the faith that it sounds like there's probably a more precise way to be able to capture the like uh, an, a very early cancer in those settings where you know the DNA is somewhere in your blood, but you can't see it on a colonoscopy. What are you doing? How are you doing it? And where can I get one? Yeah. So you're talking, I think, about a lot of the what I would regard as the upstream uh, tests before you come to someone like me for a colonoscopy. So there are plenty of uh, liquid or stool biopsy tests that will look, as you say, for DNA or markers, biomarkers of uh, indicators of potential cancer in certain organs, colon, pancreas, esophagus, ovarian, you, you know, you name it, right? So, of course, if that liquid or that stool test suggests uh, a higher risk of a colon cancer, then yes, of course, even more you should be getting a colonoscopy. So, that is not widely available, certainly outside the United States, because a lot of those liquid or stool biopsy tests, as you know, are pretty expensive and uh, getting reimbursement for those can be troublesome. But they can certainly add to the, the mix here in reducing the chance of colon cancer. Is it for now going to replace the need for invasive colonoscopy? I don't think so. Not for the foreseeable future. You know, the, 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 the signal is not strong enough or uh, specific enough to say yes or no that you do or do not have precancerous lesions. They're probably good alarms for higher risk patients to be screened or to say, hey, there might already be an early cancer that you should get scoped. Now, colonoscopy should be about prevention. So again, you mentioned it earlier, those polyps, those adenomas, most of them never become cancer, but some of them do. So if we find them all or find most of them and take them off. We're doing a, a big thing. And a lot of those also, those upstream liquid or stool biopsy tests, they have, again, the role of technology, a bit of a downstream validation problem because if you do a liquid biopsy, a blood test, that suggests that you've got a higher risk and then you have an index procedure like a colonoscopy or a CT and the lesion is missed by the human reader, Guess what? It invalidates the benefit of that of that of that liquid uh, blood test as well. So I think it's both. It's a whole continuum and a spectrum of of ways that we can reduce colon prevalence, identify patients earlier. Um, I've got a wristband on here. It wasn't deliberate that I put it on. I got it at a meeting, a GI meeting last week, and it says heartburn can cause cancer, and that's about the need for 
upper endoscopy looking for early esophageal cancer because that's much more subtle and more of a field defect than uh, the individual little polyps that we look for in colonoscopy. But, and that's a space that we absolutely need help. There are other ways to look in advance for somebody who may have a higher risk of esophageal cancer or to do genetic testing on samples or biopsies that are taken to say, okay, this is who you are now. In five years' time, your risk of getting a cancer is higher than that patient over there based on your genetic uh, makeup. We need technology to help interrogate all of those types of data, whether it be the genetics on the biopsy, whether it be the endoscopy, um, telling me that I am missing a significant but very subtle pre-cancer in the corner in the screen there. That's where technology is is helping. And I absolutely say no to the naysayers who don't think that we need to embrace this. Despite all the threats of AI that we hear about every day now in medicine, there is no doubt that we can harness the power and work with us to liberate us from things we don't need to do and want to do and make us better diagnosticians and treatment. I mean, I think uh, to it, not would just mean like it's, you know, you're arguing that there is not human error. So whether you're a very religious, pious person and and then you have to accept that we're imperfect people, or if you're not religious or pious at all, but you believe in statistics and science, you know we're imperfect people. Like, like I, I just, I don't see where, I mean, those are the two radical sides and we know that there is error. How are you... So how does AI play a part into that? Is it the fact that the the visualization during the cameras is somehow being processed outside of the eyeballs that's just a written narration of what that person saw? Is it also like processing during that in real time? I saw that you have some, you know, pretty significant research in in, in cancer genetics and genomics itself. Are you also, I thought it was very interesting what you said, can we do something more than just a pathologist who is also just a human that looks under a microscope, usually if it's not cancer, and says, I see this and it looks like this ish and that ish and these are the receptors. Like you're saying, hey, and we know the data is there. What are the predictive models on saying like, okay, if you have changes X, Y, Z, seven, eight, nine, we know that about 4% of these, just like we have lead time with polyps and adenomas and tubular villus, but in esophageal, those things can be so, I mean, so helpful, not just helpful. They actually take what we've learned and known from these kind of procedural things we still do from decades ago. These are decades ago on the way we classify and still like say you're good, you're bad, you're maybe, I don't know, we get another one in five years. You're saying, yo, we should use the things that we know retrospectively on like what has turned into something bad or not and just kind of get out of that histopath. Is your, is, is, are you fi looking at AI to be used in all those settings, like the visualization and the analysis of the tissue itself and all? Yeah, I'm definitely saying yo to a lot of that. Sure. I'll tell you that for sure. The um, so let's go back to the polyps as an example because it the 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 fairly easy to conceptualize. It's a little you know mushroom shaped or in size lesion on the colon lining or smaller than a mushroom, um, uh, but visible, a raised lesion usually, so people can visualize what the polyp looks like. The human eye, as you said, Sanjay, for in GI maybe for ten, fifteen years is being told that if you know what you're looking at and you look carefully and you maybe magnify the image on the screen and you take your time, you can look for three features on that polyp, like facial recognition, that can tell you what kind of polyp you're looking at, whether it's precancerous or not. And those three features are color, the shape of the little, what we call pits, which is the little um, glands on the polyp surface, and the vascular pattern or the, ve or the pattern of the blood vessels on the polyp. So color, uh, pit pattern and blood vessel pattern. That's what the human eye looks for. And the human experts, so true global experts in this space, are very good at that. But most people are not global experts in this space, right? They're the day-to-day -day physicians and we all got to do many different things. And when, for example, my own group and others have trained AI models that in live time, to answer your question about live time, in, during a procedure, an AI model can also look at that polyp and say, with high confidence, that is an adenoma, that is not. I've had some of my global expert colleagues in this space say, hey, that's great. What's the machine seeing that maybe I need to be looking for as well as those three features? And I say, well, when we peeled the machine algorithm apart, we saw that the uh, AI was seeing at least a 1,000 features per polyp to make that distinction. 
things that we can't even conceptualize, right? Edges, zeros and ones, it's all code and math and whatever. Right? So the machine is seeing things that the human literally cannot see or too many things that the human cannot quickly process and put together. Um, so I tell my um, physician experts in this space, stop trying to think always like a human. Accept that, yes, we need to know how AI works, and I'm sure we'll talk about it at some point uh, uh, in this podcast, but one of the reasons that we put together the book that has just come out is to bring the basics of AI to the medical professional. They don't need to all be experts in this space, but they need to understand that um, it works in a different way. And yes, we need to understand to some degree how it works, but if you really want an open box rather than this so-called black box in AI, um, you're going to have to do a lot of math and coding reading to know what it is you're uh, being told how these models work. So there has to be some degree of acceptance that in studies, it's been shown to be true that a model will predict a pathology better than the human. But again, I'll go back to the human eye sees three things. The machine is seeing at least a thousand. I don't quite know how you can bridge that gap um, uh, with the human performance. And I mean, just to let's just get into it with the AI thing. I'll tell you as someone that I think can appreciate it in part because my dad was or is, I guess, an engineer and he did Six Sigma Black Belt before everyone did it. And, you know, it was it, he just taught me about algorithms and standard deviations and all this stuff. Even when I'm emotional, he tries to talk to me about standard deviations and, and algorithms. And the truth of the matter is they are the fundamentals of life of everything. I mean, even from that speed that's suggested when you're turning a curve, right? Like in your car, it's not just a guess. It is a calculation based on what percentage of people are unlikely to slip when that coefficient of friction of the rubber and the and the tires at that angle, what do you need with, say somebody hasn't changed their tires, most people haven't changed it, you know, or, or overdue by however many months. They calculate all of that, the tread length and everything to say, this is the minimum because if you, like, and they do it obviously liberally to make sure that most people are safe. That is a very simple, I used to teach physics, if you can't tell for the MCAT, like just medical uh, prep for our step one or for our MCAT. But when I see those examples, it made me appreciate from an early age, really all that like is determined in life and physics. And when you break everything down is statistical and medicine, statistical likelihood, looking at everything, not just planar or bi-dimensionally, but if you could in 360 different ways. And how I see AI is when you're going in there, you cannot calculate millions of examples of what the ratio of that like one blood vessel to that polyp to when the thing turns a corner and stuff. Obviously, that is a computational, extremely elite analysis, not guesswork, but based on data that it has queried and found very tight, very tight intervals and in standard deviations of six sigma means six deltas of, of uh, six sigmas of like standard deviation. You know, obviously two or whatever being 5%, 2.5%. Imagine it all the way down. Now imagine that times who knows what, logarithmically, that's what an AI system is doing. It is saying every relationship that you can possibly conceive, I query all the data in real time at that moment, of millions of examples and see what is an outlier and what, and I already know what happens to that outlier. And so I think that from a lay person is how I explain why the application of AI does not substitute, but by all means, you have a macroscopic visualization on your camera. Now you have all the data and statistics of everything you've computed and analyzed for however you're getting it. And how you could argue that those things wouldn't be adjunctive blows my mind personally. Maybe I need AI software to just try to understand it. But like that 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 concept that it's not necessary when we have just troves of data. But as somebody that's been doing this for 10 years before AI, AI is cool now because of chat GTP. It's like you were on TikTok when we were on Facebook. That's what you were for AI when I read, when I read your bio. So tell me, uh, what do you like to kind of just not necessarily convince someone? I don't think it takes convincing, but just teach somebody fundamentally what AI is. So, I mean, you've raised so many important points uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of minutes. Um, again, if we go back to, uh, we'll just keep using the endoscopy or the colonoscopy as the example as the example here. Uh, the um, there's so much other data about a particular patient that needs to inform uh, um, what we're doing. So yes, 
I need to have somebody, imp uh, something hopefully improve my performance during a procedure. So hopefully I've convinced you and the, and, and the audience that AI tools in the basic things like polyps can certainly help, do certainly help. Plenty of studies confirming that. But I would like that the, the physician and the machine take into account all the other important metadata about the patient, their age, their sex, their previous history. Maybe there's some genetic information that I have from a blood test that they've had done, their prior drug history, their uh, dietary history, family history. All of these things, we've, we've already, I've only mentioned what, seven or eight points. There are many, many, many potentially uh, a relevant data points about a particular patient or a particular population um, that play into knowing that if I see a particular type of lesion in the colon, if I throw in all those other data points, I can be not just preventative, I can be predictive about how that patient may do in five, 10 years time and how often they need to have more procedures. It's not, right now it's cookie cutter. It's a uh, Bit of a conveyor belt. We have guidelines that we follow, hopefully mostly. A lot of the time people don't follow guidelines. But we need to personalize as well the approach to imaging, testing, intervention, screen. Not everybody needs to have a colonoscopy every five years after polyps. Some need them two years later. Some need them 10 years later. And we can use machines or rather AI to help us digest all of the litany of data points that we have on many patients. And we should re regard that as something that the human cannot just process. There's a, there's a, maybe there's a, a website that you use as well called up to date. Um, <laughs> All the time. It's a medical. Yeah. Why do we use up to date? Because we're busy. We read a lot of medical uh, texts. We read a lot of journals, papers. We do research. And I like to think I'm up to date in my field, but I cannot read every single paper. I'm far too busy, and there are far too many papers out there now in the digital age. And up to date is great because it tries to do what I struggle to do: keep me up to date by digesting. It gets updated on a semi, fairly regular basis, but it's not exhaustive, and there are many gaps in it. And the machine is a kind of like up to date live. It brings in all of those recent studies, everything new that we've learned all of the multitude of data points that we have about that patient and hopefully can put it there for you and be relevant in live time or in a clinic setting or, you know, predicting response to treatment, you know, getting out of routine colonoscopy uh, talk here. So there's so many, it's simply, well, it's not simply, there's many barriers here to human performance uh, getting better. Um, and one of them is that we simply, unless we develop super brains, we just cannot process everything coming at us or that we should be using to inform us about our patients. It, you know, I think it's, we, it's, it's our role as medical professionals to educate, get the confidence of our patients and our medical peers that we need to see technology as an assistant and an aid rather than a threat. That's really important. And that message hasn't yet gotten through to many, many people, and that's okay. But it's our role as advocates in the space to safely gain the confidence so that people recognize, sure, you know what? Doctors or medical professionals are humans. They're prone to error. How can we help them? It's difficult for me to like understand the, the I mean, a resistance. I mean, I'm somewhat aware of it, I guess. But the problem is everyone makes everyone think everything binary. I'm they're just always, well, AI didn't work out with what I'm like. AI is not Watson. AI is not like trying to say like, I'm going to substitute a doctor. It is so not binary. It's not like a AI or no AI. It's like, it's, it's saying like, do you need like 1080 camera for your endo endoscopy or 420 HP? It's like, it's like, oh, well, you know, the whole like 1080K didn't work out. I mean, it's just like, I, I can't, I can't make an example small enough to make this very dismissive binary placement of AI, um, you know, for how I appreciate it, you know, equally represented. I'll tell you, even like up to date, you know, and respectfully, one of my early mentors, Pracha Irmond, he he was uh, one of the people that founded up to date as a, a startup. They were doing just renal nephrology, and he kind of taught me how they went through and thought about it. But even that's extremely analog compared to what AI is. And you just blew my mind, like 
when you said, Sanjay, I'm not just talking about during the endos- endoscopic procedure and being able to highlight abnormalities just based on standard, you know, deviations of like and relationships and, and symmetry and all this stuff. I'm not even talking about that. And this goes back to the multi-planar. So if 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 up to date is two planes, one or two planes, I know patients like this are like this and you know, are like this or like this. AI takes all of it. You're like, I can I can process all of these different elements, their their amount of fiber intake, their family history, where they live geographically, if they have diabetes or not. I can take everything I know about those independently. I can take everything I know about them in conjunction, if in case it's not just additive, but actually like amplified. And I can do all of those things with a mold like with a like the factorial of relationships okay these two and then these three and then these four how we have to multiply the same numbers and i can do it all at once while you are actually looking at these features and i can query what's happened to these people in different factorials while i'm visualizing this in the scope like i'm getting yeah chills well i don't want to mislead the audience here so you know that is certainly where we need to go but where we need we're to getting go there. Saying, like it's it's we're not there yet but it's right. conceivable and like absolutely and the argument that you don't need that like that's the thing it's like we're good or like why i work very i think i'm a, a really good hematologist oncologist i hope but it's like it doesn't mean i can't get better right like that's the thing i can't i, I can have tools and aids to query things just like chat gp in a second i mean i'm glad it's out just so people can somewhat understand the same way it queries whatever you're doing imagine you queried 10 of those to the 10th about 10 different variables with the doctor and then just like and they had that information that's how i see it personally but but uh, oh, there's so much um again in that so you know we've got big problems in ai that people raise their hand and say oh what about you know bias and and ethical use and models that um actually work against certain populations and there's been lots of uh um unfortunate events in the last several years in medicine uh, where you know particular AI models have been developed um, that work against certain ethnicities, um, uh, for example, uh, because they were trained on narrow data. Um, thankfully, we are in a digital age, and thankfully, healthcare systems are, get, are getting better at making uh, c- uh, recording data in a more usable form. And I don't just mean you know, patient note data with all the electronic health record systems that we have, imaging data, in my world, video data. Thankfully, we are finally moving away from maybe taking a couple of snap images that get stored on the hard drive in the endoscopy room to actually having full video type information, uh, lots of images that get stored centrally and so-called real world evidence from a variety of populations, ethnicities, ethnicities uh, 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 patient types over the globe. And with the promise of that kind of data availability, we can move forward and make these models even more useful, more predictive, more accurate in live time so that they achieve or exceed human performance. Uh, you know, that's all ahead of us the, because we're, we're only just starting the, the data garnering game in medicine. Uh, you know, we've got swathes of data that we have no idea how to digest and machines can, and they need that. You know, there's no data engineer. I've got, you know, a number of people in my own company who just sit with the data all day and they will never, ever, ever turn down more data. You never get a data scientist who'll say, no, I've got enough data. Thanks very much. They want more and more because the machines are data hungry and they're hungry for a reason, uh, hopefully, and they're hungry or that we should be happy uh, with more generalized data, real world data from around the globe that will get better and better performance and delay the concerns that people still have, which are totally understandable. If your endoscopist, you know, sees the normal distribution of Americans or not, like 80%, you know, Caucasians and people of color, you know, 15%, 20%, 10%, whatever. One application, one simple one is there's tons of literature showing that obviously there's different properties and people of color and minorities, including myself, compared to Caucasians when it comes to breast tissue and colon and all these things. If you could query, if you could filter out, especially as a minority, for all of the features that are applicable to a South Asian man or somebody that is African American, and then have that kind of supplemental analysis, unless your endoscopist also only does, you know, that that demographic or or that um, 
you know, racial, ethnicity, whatever you want to call it, they're going to be limited to what they've seen with their eyeballs. And we know that it makes a difference. And all of a sudden you can just even sample from that pool alone. And then also other things like you said, diabetes and weight and obesity and that. It's just, when I think of it, I just think of so many outs, like of, of, because we know we have things that are retrospective backwards. We have things that we know evolve into other uh, things down the line and we can query all of that. And that's what AI is. I mean, would you agree? I don't know why I know a lot of AI, you know, people, I don't know how I'm around the, around the likes of you, you, you smart ones. I feel like I'm just almost an imposter most of the time, but would you say that AI is not fair to be a blanket term? Like, do you think it's used loosely or is it all AI or all not? And it just matters on how you use it. Because like you said, you know, the failures, I would argue it's not that AI failed. It's that the people that enabled and employed AI that didn't filter out for the people that had different backgrounds, it's that component that failed. It's actually the human, surprisingly, that failed. And it's not so much, you know, AI in that binary sense. Yeah, it's definitely not uh, all or nothing binary, yes or no, AI or not. It's um, one of the uh, chapters in, um, in our textbook, uh, one of the authors describes AI as uh, augmented intelligence that was her preferred term uh, for ai now you know we stuck with the term artificial intelligence for for the book because that's what is generally used and people understand but i like the definition augmented intelligence in medicine because it shows that it's it's working with us right it liberates us from some of the tedium of our jobs that we shouldn't be doing or rather that we could be focused on better things for our patients uh, than doing it um, uh, en encompasses the concept that we can actually improve the doctor's performance. It augments us rather than replaces us. It's assistive. Um, there's another term that people use in the med in medical space with AI of hybrid intelligence, where it's the human and the machine in harmony work together. Um, so it's not, you know, and again, it's the AI of today is not the AI of last year or the AI of, you know, of next year. Yes, we as physicians are getting better. We've been using technology for centuries or whatever you want to call technology, right? We've been using advances uh, since the industrial age in medicine, right? Through devices, surgical instruments, cameras, pharmaceuticals, and we get better. That's all technology. Well, this is just the newer age. This is the digital technology. We've been using really fancy cameras in my space, in the, in the operating room for years. They're getting better and better. Which, uh, you know, I'm an old man. My TV in 1970, I was young. I'm old enough to remember getting a color TV from a black and white TV in sometime in the 70s. And that was transformative. But we forget that we used to watch this TV screen that had poor resolution, was black and white, went to color. And now we've got a flat screen and it's got higher and higher definition and 1080p and on and on and on because it's slowly progressive. Well, that's the same with imaging over the years. The image on screen for the doctor is getting more and more detailed. Well, I don't know about you, but you know, a 4K TV now gives me a headache because there's so much data on that screen and overload. Um, I don't need it. Maybe people like the clarity, but I don't think the human eye can conceptualize a lot of it. And that's certainly the case in medical imaging. Uh, so we're at the point now where the technology, the definition on screen, the data to interrogate is getting more and more and more and definitely surpassing human processing. So we're lagging behind our ability to interpret advances in medical technology. So you might, you might say, well, if there's nothing else to help us interpret what we're looking at, you should just stop because we're not, we're not, human performance hasn't gotten a lot better. Let's say in some of the fields that I've mentioned today, human performance hasn't gotten significantly better despite advances in technology. That shows us a gap somewhere. And it's the interpretation of the information that the technology hopefully is throwing at us and we just can't digest it. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And it's like, to your example, I only recently learned, maybe like a month ago, that on your iPhone, when you go to your pictures, even like I tried to not put my, all my data out there with geolocations and stuff. But even if I type 
car or license just randomly in my photos somehow it pulls up all the cars and like that i've ever taken a picture of not that i take pictures of cars i don't know why i said that but like in licenses and nobody seems to question it it's sketchy like or you could think it or it's not sketchy but there is a data collection it's not a human being like oh i've been watching this i've been waiting for you to ask it's not that it's just it has statistics on seeing and perceiving based on how you know the tires look and stuff to say this is probably a car it's not that it's necessarily you know stolen or somebody's in the background like figuring it out that's just what computations are they can help and have a good guess that aids you into being able to recognize something that your eyeballs could easily pick and in your case you're talking about something very serious which is cancer and i want to make this very clear and i think if anyone's listening to this and they're like yeah i get it but i want to see but i don't get it and how's it gonna help cancer if we're not missing cancer the point is especially on non-medical podcasts where i'm a guest they say how are we going to beat cancer how are we going to cure cancer when does curing cancer go away i used to go on this big thing about like well you know that's not a good question because da, da, da. but now i say something much cleaner and quicker the way we beat cancer is to not let it get to cancer because cancer like you don't know which cell in your body which a a cell in my in my mouth in my innocent cheek one day could turn into adenoid cancer but i just don't know i didn't catch it in the air but what you're doing and that's what the beauty of the intestine is you know to a large degree maybe everything but at least we know that in the intestines and upper and uh, lower gi is what you're doing is finding a way and you're talking about finding a way of the things that look like they will become cancer to take that little colony or population out, just like you take out a sketchy mole. Like, oh, it, it was pre-cancer. It wouldn't have been melanoma. Oh, it was nothing. But it was still messed up. What I hope people realize is the more accurately we can find these things that are clues that we've been very humbled in medicine to learn every year is, oh, we had no idea that was a problem or that that, that much actually turned into cancer. If we can recognize those things, that is my answer when people ask me, how do we beat cancer? It's, you know, when it's on third base trying to steal, I don't know if you have baseball in Canada or the UK, so you may not understand this, where you're on third and you're trying to get to home run, or you were in North Carolina briefly, Um, but home run being a bad thing, get it out then. And that's how you don't have any runs. It's a score of zero for cancer because they're not getting there because you're able to get it there sooner. And the way we can do that You can either trust eyeballs or you can trust all the computational data that we've had and we know what things look like. And that is our best shot that I concede other than, and we can go in forever about how they're talking about curing it. Get a vaccine that recognizes a common protein that ends up being a bad player or the gun for cancer. Sure. Yeah, do that. But what if it's a different protein? But for things that have lead times, and I use the example of cervical cancer because many experts argue cervical cancer should not exist with where we are in technology and our understanding. Of, of messed up things on the cervix that are turning into, you know, everyone has the, the pap smears, but then they get back in a leap and a cone. Those are all lead times. And if you truly got your pap smears in and in the right intervals, and, and of course you've got Gardasil because we know, or whatever the vaccine is uh, elsewhere in Canada, uh, if, you, if you prevent the, um, the virus, those are lead times to where that's why people, women shouldn't get cervical cancer. If we could say that, about GI cancers, if we could pick up things the same way we know CIN 1, 2, and 3 and get the leap and get the cone and get all that stuff, that's how you make things go away because they don't appear. They get out, they get tagged out at third base every time. And I think I think it's very reasonable, um, you know, it's not to be unreasonable. I think it's unreasonable to not believe that that that, that part of it can make a, a difference. That all makes sense, but I agree. My, 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 my quick comments on that are, uh, uh, yes, entirely agree with that. I think um, at the baseball analogy, I, I at least understand even though football or soccer is my thing. I went to the big GI meeting in Chicago last week, so I'm crossing the border, and I didn't have to pull out my Global Entry or Nexus Pass because actually when I walked through the Nexus or Global Entry lane, picture was taken of my face, and I walked through the security very, very quickly because it was all facial recognition. And we seem to be okay as a population with trusting on national security uh, on facial recognition. So if there is still a concern uh, that uh, uh, that the, the, an algorithm cannot help doctors in our day-to-day practice um, or that we shouldn't be embracing or that it's not ready, well, again, we're already trusting it with our day-to-day travel when we cross the border. So the same kind of technology that is behind facial recognition 
is being used and studied and evidenced in picking up, as you say, cancers early. And there is no doubt whatsoever in my mind and well published data supporting that we underperform in picking up cancers early. So we're back to the same thing theme again. There's no doubt whatsoever that we need to embrace technologies that will help us get better because if we're not humble enough to accept that we can get better, then advancements in medicine is dead. Yeah, 100%. And I think for those that get, I hope this isn't a, a, an off-color term, but butthurt about saying, oh, we don't do well enough. One flip side of, of thinking, and that's a, a pun to the companies, they all have puns, I noticed that you live with too. But the argument to be is, okay, we didn't underperform, everyone's great, we do a great job. The point is, even if macroscopically we can see everything, the point is we can we can actually discover things even sooner than what is achievable with like even the naked eye. So say if somebody needs to hear, you do a great job with your eyes and, and the scope and stuff, like you know, you're shooting 100%. But the truth is there are features and there is data that can get us like uh, to 125% that it's just not possible. And so I think that may make it a little bit more receptive for others on saying it's not that we're, because you and I know we're not good enough. We're imperfect beings. We have fatigue. I mean, we we know that, but we also know the, the ego narcissism in medicine. But just say it's, it's great, 100% you agree with your eyeballs, but then this actually just allows for features and detection that's even a, a level deeper and that's based on all the data that we know that this is what things turn into at a later time in this population. I don't know. We could talk about this forever. I, I'm, I, if anything, I'm discouraged that there's resistance. Not to say like, hey, replace everybody with AI. That's no, nobody's saying that. But but it sounds like you're doing the really the hard work to even make it possible. And um, you can't pick and choose your data. Like if you're a doctor, you got there. You have to believe in data, like recommendations, standards, standard of care, standard deviations, the labs. Everything is data based. If the data shows, and I know there's several studies where major centers will bring in the top experts and show them slides of whatever that thing is and say, guess what this is? Malignant, not malignant, did it turn out, did it not? AI outperforms those 20 to 30 experts. Like I paid a lot of money apparently to get there. Every time. Like, I mean, it's like, it's it's no, I mean, I just feel like that's the end of the argument, at least on saying, can, you know, AI and, and being able to query all the data and observations that it can do with its multi-planar 360 direction brain versus our brain, you know, just, just add it, just get it, get it involved. Yeah. I, yes. Uh, I mean, you know, I think, I think we need to address contemporary concerns when people read about, you know, chat GBT and, and it can pass the, you know, the MCATs or whatever, as well as a uh, medical student. Uh, um, or will be medical students. A lot of that is, you know, just throwing swathes of data and recognizing questions. And if you throw some sort of curveball where it needs contextual thinking, it, it fails, right? So in medicine, at least for now, we're not moving quickly towards what they call AGI or artificial generalized intelligence, right? Where where there's sentient intelligence and it's making the decisions instead of us. It's very much, you know, in, in AI, there's a, there's a term human in the loop. So in medicine, maybe it's physician in the loop, um, where we're very involved in the decision around that patient or that cohort or that group of patients, right? It's not like we're going to give up. Again, in radiology, get out of the GI space. There's so much um, logistic stuff that radiologists and allies staff have to do that actually machines can do way easier, way quicker, way better, and leaves the doctor to interpret the important contextual information around a particular scan and have the AI help them interpret it, things they may have missed, and then add their own in, uh, experience, uh, contextual stuff around the patient, whatever, into the mixer, right? So liberate us from some of the tedium and let us really focus. So it's not about handing everything over to, to machines. Um, uh, it is about handing some stuff over, uh, but we always uh, need to be involved and we will remain involved in the healthcare space for sure. Um, certainly, you know, in my lifetime, I'm certain about that, but um, who knows, you know, you know, we have this podcast in you know, 50 years time, might be a different. Right, Probably right. Years, yeah, and I hope to have one. Yeah. You know, our digital, we'll be doing these uh 
Uh, my future digital twin will be doing this call. Well, he won't be as good looking, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, well. I knew there was a reason that I said yes to this podcast. <laughs> well, your mom made, paid me a lot of money to make that initial intro. So There you go. I'm going to joke about it, but I would love... I've never had a positive capsule study. Is that, you know, the thing where if anyone's listening, it's like, oh, we're going to do a capsule study. I mean, are they just terrible? Or like, I, I've never seen like, aha, the capsule study found that thing in that part of the ilium. And then we're so glad we did the capsule. No, they're good. They are good. Um, you know, the capsule, just to, 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 to address that one, was mainly devised initially for the small intestine. And there's not a huge amount of cancerous pathology, for example, in the small intestine. Right. It's looking for bleeds. It's looking for anemia sources. That's probably why you use it. It's looking for things like Crohn's disease, so inflammatory bowel disease. But, you know, capsule technology is improving dramatically. But that also, Sanjay, illustrates the need for technology. Some of those capsule studies are hours in length. And how do they get read? They get read by a physician, yeah. usually in the evening after work, going home and sitting with a reader where they can fast forward. And they're quite tedious to report and things get missed. There are more and more tools now that can assist a doctor it can point them to an area in the three hours of video where it thinks is the most relevant part of the video and say hey what do you think about this we've done some stuff at my own group in clinical trials right so out of um cancer but in things like crohn's and colitis where to get a patient into a trial the current standard is that the doctor doing the colonoscopy is not trusted to be objected for that patient to meet the inclusion criteria for the trial. So the drug company, of course, wants clean inclusion based on criteria. So they insist that the procedure is videoed and it goes into a remote cloud and somewhere sometime, hopefully in the next few days, a so-called expert reads that video often in the evening after work. They're 15, 20 minute videos. We devised a technology that will read that video in 30 seconds. But how we anticipate it being used is that it directs the doctor, the reader, to the area that it thinks is the most relevant. And if the doctor agrees, they can move to the next segment. Or if they disagree, they have the ability to toggle the scores up or down and then move on. But it undoubtedly assists the situation. It makes trial inclusion quicker, better for the patient, cleaner, endpoints are met. You know, maybe I'm preaching to the converter with you here from the last... 50 minutes just sounds like I am, but um, no, but there are mean, undoubtedly hurdles and barriers and issues and uh, things we need to think about, right? That are precautions to take with overuse of AI or over reliance. But I'm yet to be convinced that we're going down the wrong path. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, we address some very important things is when we say it was fine, and I'm guilty of this, and a lot of I think people are, we just take it to mean. A hundred percent, like it was fine. Like we don't actually consider, like with the capsule study, that something could have been. We don't even consider that, right? At least as a community oncologist or hematologist. And the truth of the matter is, in the same way, if nobody has a problem with these heart monitors that are seventy-two hours or a week, you know, seven, ten days. I, I strongly consider doing electrophysiology, actually, like in residency. And I mean, I do cardiology first, but I would sit there and read and learn all this. And I was like, we got to go through all of this. I was like, we. Have, Bro, we have to go through all this, like we're doing it. And they're like, well, no, this is what helps. And it shows you the parts that are not classic, beautiful QRS waves, like, like PQRS, T, whatever. And, and, and I was like, oh, thank goodness. Like, but he waited to show me that like, there's a, a quicker way because he was trying to scare me to say like, I'd be there all night. He's like, now we can see all the abnormalities. And then it gives us our guests, just like an EKG. If you, you know, move and a lot of, I see primary doctors, um, you know, we'll just read the interpretation at the top and stuff. But, but the truth of the matter is they help. We're not saying it's like, oh, what it says on the paper is or isn't, right? And then same with that very long lead time. It's the same as I think. If you're going to see three hours of thing, see where it looks even remotely sketchy, where you made it on dot and thought it was sketchy because the first hour was not sketchy. And I'm using the word sketchy a lot. But we can go on forever about this. But it, it, that's another example of like in the way you're saying it's like there's no problem with the augmentation uh or assistance, you know, alley-oop, that's a basketball term, like, uh, you got the Raptors, um, to basically, like, bring in your attention some, right? That's the whole, it's like, like that, I mean, if, if you would accept just that, then you are actually surprisingly a technology supporter in medicine. Should they bring your attention to that part of the strip in the 72-hour heart monitor? 
Yeah. So you are, I'm, you're doing great things. Um, I'm sorry. I hate that there is, I'm, I guess, a little humble to realize there's more resistance than I realized, but we'll get there. The point is we'll get there. What scares me is how many people could have benefited or, you know, found something sooner if we got there sooner. Like that's, it's not a matter of if we'll get there. I know we will. Like data is data, statistics, statistics, they don't lie. But I just, I always think about, you know, my stage four patients and, or, or anyone that's in a scare in a, in a stage two, stage three, I'm like, but those people, those individuals with those names and those families, until we optimize healthcare across the board, AI, not AI, whatever it is, there is a cost and it's the lives of those people during that time. So I appreciate everything you're doing. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't actually have a hard copy yet, but the reason, again, shameless plug it, the reason that we, I, I lead edited this textbook for Wiley, so it's called AI in Clinical Medicine, a Practical Guide for the Healthcare Professional, is because we, I think there's an absolute need to evangelize the story of technology to your average medical professional. I don't, we don't need everybody to understand AI code and exactly how it works. We just need to promote it appropriately, point out the pitfalls, get confidence so that people, most doctors don't know how many of the drugs that they prescribe work. If you ask some of your colleagues, my colleagues, how does drug X actually work? What's the mechanism of action? What's the target that it's inhibiting or whatever? They go, oh uh, yeah, that's a, uh, no, it's not, right? So a lot of the time, they just follow patterns and what they've heard and seen and read without knowing exactly how the drug works or even in exactly how it works. Well, it's the same with other technologies. So that's that was important to try and give a basic lexicon for healthcare professionals. We we got a robot. Uh, the art on the cover here, uh, which I'm showing, is uh, was was actually done by a, a robot called uh, Ada or Ida, A I D A. Um, the world's first robotic artist. Um, and the idea with that project was to show that AI can be creative, right? We've seen several examples of, of creative text and trying to replicate what Shakespeare did and all that kind of stuff, but uh, also highlight the pitfalls and the danger and the um, issues that we need to consider to make ethical AI. So through art. So I, I was keen to, you know, get if we could the um, some of the cover type artwork to to highlight AI can do great things. It can do nice creative things. It can even help. But we, you know, medicine is a science, but it's also an art. So you know, anything we can do to incorporate um, other flavors, other directions to go, but also pointing out, being fun, but pointing out that there are needs to consider ethical AI because it really is important. Despite all the things I've said to you in the last hour about how critical technology is and how we need to embrace it, we also need to recognize that people have understandable concerns uh, about the foibles of AI and and technology. So that's for us. And what you're doing here on this podcast, it's for you to help people understand what we can do better with cancer. I know that's a big um, uh, premise of your of your talks, but um, but also to help people embrace technology and not be scared by it. 100%. That's the, that's the purpose. This is a real pleasure, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, I work in help, let me know. And I'm interested to get your book. I'm going to get it. I'll tell you, nobody's lost, at least in social media, on the AI piece of the artwork because there was this about a month window, month or two, where everybody on social media was downloading the app Lenza. And you just basically put in 20 of your uh, pictures, portraits. I did it for my kid. I did it for um, all my family members on it. And it obviously looks at the orientation. Da, 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 da. And then it makes them like makes you a Viking and a knight and a and a and a and I mean it was absolutely like mind blowing the way that it really pictured like in you and Shakespearean time and everything it was it was pretty compelling so I think I think there's definitely hope for you know as the as the younger generation pops out into this into this world which is not me cool. even, unfortunately I I'm a <laughs> believer but I'm not young <laughs> okay well you said it not me. <laughs>